Please join me in the call to worship. For this purpose, the right side would be here and the left side would be here. So please follow the responsive reading, right, left. Here is the man. Jesus accused of being a criminal. Here is your king. Here is the man who gives no answer. Here is your king. Jesus, Son of God. Jesus, Jesus the, one the one we have gathered to worship. Please join me in the opening hymn, In the Cross of Christ I Glory, hymn number 295 verses 1 to 3. disciple, 
binding them to one another as a new family. When we when feel, feel overcome, overcome by guilt, we remember that you spoke grace to a thief. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Your love for us is just that boundless, ever-present, and good. Thank you. What else can we say here in the dimness, in the darkness? But thank you. Amen. And the hymn, Lamb of God. of our pastor, Reverend Sharon Petgrave Cundy, Deacon Cox, the officers and members of this church, I greet you in the precious name of Jesus as we recall and contemplate 
on the last words of Jesus before his death. Let us solemnly remember that Jesus died so that we may have life and may have life more abundantly. And for that we say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And so it is. Amen and amen. The first word, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And the congregational hymn will be number 286, O Sacred Head, Now Wounded. on the first words. Brother Hall.
Praise the Lord. Uh, it's a wonderful thing, a wonderful thing that we can stand here this morning knowing that the Lord was crucified on, this, the, uh, on the first, on the Friday, and he raised on the Sunday. So, so we know sometimes, you know, things don't go as planned. So we all have to know, we're glad, I'm glad this morning I got the first word and said, Father, forgive them. So, so, so at times, that's one of the main things that we need in life to go a long way. But as I stand here before you this morning, I just say good morning to each and every individual that here with us to lift up the holy name. This moment, I just pray right now, most righteous and eternal Father, Father of heaven, I pray that the word of my mouth this moment, O oh God, will accept it to your people, that we will learn to move on with you, God, knowing that in you all things are possible. In your holy, precious name. Amen. Well, this morning, as I call upon to, say, to lead the first word, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When, when you read that, script, this, that scripture in Luke, even from say, this, the, um, the, six, the 26 verse up unto the 34, we couldn't realize the amount of things that Jesus go through. But at the end, he could say, Father, forgive them. So, so we know when we, we come and talking about forgiveness, forgiveness is not somebody who don't wrong you. But often time, we want to forgive the person that loves us. And it passed impossible with God. Sometimes I heard some story that people talk, and some of them maybe sound like legit, or maybe sound um, good. But I want to tell you, they are false. There is a story that they talk about that forgive and don't forget. That's our false. The Bible don't teach it. And if the Bible don't teach it, it is false. Because I think when we, we even look in the book of Micah and the 19 verse, when it comes down to the end, he says, take all our sins, all our iniquity, and cast into the sea of forgetfulness. So if Jesus do that, if God do that for us, how can we say we forgive someone when we're still walking with that um, still working with that burning and saying you forgive. Forgiveness is something you're going to forgive somebody that wronged you. No wonder when you say the Our Father prayer, it said forgive them that trespass against you. We don't want to only forgive those people that love us because that is not forgiveness. And the main thing, when you forgive someone, you got to move on from it. You can't forgive me this week and next week because, because that we are human and you're going to do things again. Maybe don't please this to me. You say last week you did do that. Then you didn't forgive him. If you forgive him, you forgive him and move on. So, so you know, Jesus is saying, you know, because the heart of forgiveness is, is in the spirit of God. For God, because the forgiveness that contain with the holy person, uh, with another person, is the person who wrong you. Even though sometimes, as human, it's hard. No wonder David said, if, I, if it was an enemy, I've done me the thing, he would rejoice. But when he looked at it, he said, you know, what, what he still said, it, it was the same people that he went into the house of Lord with. Who now lift up the meal against him? I'm telling you, the truth is hard for us to, when somebody like that to forgive them. But what I say the Bible teaches, we have to forgive them. No matter how hard it looks, no matter how wonderful we maybe believe that, no. Because 
it's in the, say, the, the scripture still telling us, if we don't forgive our, them, their trespasses, oh, we expect God to forgive us. And then we say we forgive, but we're still going on. We forgive the brother we can't sit beside him. We forget the, forgive the sister we don't want to see when he comes through the door. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness, you got to forgive it and forget it and move on. As Paul said, we are pressing on to the higher mark. And when we're pressing on, we are, with forgiveness, you are moving up. Somebody, somebody would say, you know, we are just moving up the way, way to, to God. And we know in, we, we, we don't have to worry about everything. We're not going to write at all time. But we can forgive one, the one that just passed against us. We know the people that do we wrong. We can forgive them and move on. Because, no, because forgiveness is not for the only the person who you're forgiving. It's forgiveness is for you. Because if you come in with the burning, wherever time you say, but I'll come through the door, you, you, you're mad. It's, you are in trouble. So that's why I teach you, so you have to leave them burning. You have to leave them thing at the cross, you, you know, in forgiveness. When you kneel at the cross, you leave them there. Like when the scriptures say, if you went to the altar to offer the gift, and you know your brother have a wit against you, it's a go. We can sell with him. Come again. And when you come, you can't give your offering. Because, but you can't sit there with bitterness and, for, and think you are forgiven. You are not. So, so we, are, we, are, we are just, we are, as we call ourselves, Christian call to be forgiveness. No wonder, we read in the scripture, we read about Joseph from in the Old Testament, in Genesis of to fish every creature. What, 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 what Joseph go through, he could be a revengeous person. He have a right to be revenged. But when his brother come to the end, he tell them, he said, no man, don't worry about that. God has sent me to make the way for you. So some of the things that we are going through is God is preparing you for a greater day. So, so we know forgiveness means you got to leave those things behind. No matter, no matter when they stone Stephen unto death. At, at the last, of, uh, Acts 6, and I, I don't get to those um, 50 something verse where he said, what Stephen, when they, when they stone him, Call upon everything. Kill him for no reason. But at the last word, Stephen said, lay not this sin to their charge. Just like Jesus saying today, lay not this sin unto their charge. We have to learn to forgive one another. We have to learn to move on. When times, sometimes maybe rough, as we would say, sometimes things not going our way, but forgiveness can lead us a long way. No, no, no matter what, if we then teaching others about following God, how we can be forgiven. We forgive, we forgive when it pleases us, when it looks good. Forgiveness is not that. Forgiveness is after you have to forgive the wrong the person done you. And, and when, when we begin to forgive one another, we know we begin to love one another more. Because something goes together. For, oh, can we say then, we are teaching others about following Jesus. If we, when we to leave, Another, another of the truth, truly, be teaching them humility. But the Lord, we must lean on him. Example, that Jesus set before us the truth to God. God, in doing so, we teach other, we teach those things that wrong, those people that wrong us. We have to teach them 
We have to forgive them and ask them to keep, uh, you know, ask God for forgiveness for me that we can move on. But because without the forgiveness of God, none of us wouldn't be able to be here this morning. But because of his forgiveness, we all could be here singing Hosanna in the eyes. So this morning, this is my few word to you in Jesus' name. Let us pray in unison. Almighty and everlasting God, grant us so to celebrate the mysteries of our Lord's passion that we, obtaining pardon through his precious blood, may come with joy to the commemoration of that sacrifice by which you have been pleased to redeem us through the same, thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Hall, for that message. The second word is taken from Luke chapter 23, reading verses 35 to 43. Luke chapter 23, verses 35 to 43. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the King of Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? He said, Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. And now Sister Winsome Davis will meditate on the second word. Sister Davis. And the congregational hymn will be number 288. Were you there?
Alleluia. Alleluia. Oh God, words defy this moment to say thank you for all that you went through for us so that we could stand now and praise your name. Thank you. Thank you, God, for devising this plan for mankind. Oh, we, our hearts are overwhelmed at this moment, God. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Today you'll be with me in paradise. What a beautiful, comforting statement. Maybe one of the most encouraging verses in scripture. Not a promise to provide help sometime in the future. No list of things to complete before the request is granted. No statement that it's too late now. You've had all your chances. No. Jesus responds to a request to be remembered and gives a place in his kingdom, paradise. The place of unbroken relationship with God. Interestingly, our Bible begins with paradise, the Garden of Eden, with all its lovely provisions and, yes, God's daily walk with man. And the story ends again with paradise in Revelation when John in his vision saw the new Jerusalem with the river of the water of life flowing from God's throne. No need for light for our God's presence is the light. And of course, to top it all, the invitation from the Spirit says, Come, come, whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him come and take the free gift of water of life. Hallelujah! What a scene. And in between, in the Gospels, our Jesus was always talking about the kingdom of God. In fact, he stated that seeking his kingdom should be our main priority. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he taught his disciples. And on so many occasions, his teaching began with the words, the kingdom of God is like, always showing a stark difference to what was accepted. Let us now look at what, who Jesus was offering a place in paradise, a place in his kingdom, a criminal, a person who committed treason and now sentenced to death. Remember that in the time of Jesus, Israel was an occupied state. The Romans were in charge, and because of their ruthlessness, there were pockets of resistance all over the country, led by zealots who were inciting the people to rebel against the Roman Empire. Rome would have none of that, as anyone who was caught defying their authority was sentenced to the cruel death of crucifixion. Fiction. On the other hand, paradise in Judaism was a reward only for the righteous. So you can just imagine the shock when the Jews, particularly those religious leaders hanging around the cross to ensure that Jesus was put to death, heard Jesus offering paradise to this criminal. We can just imagine the grumbling. What is he doing? Only God can offer paradise. And no way would God offer that to this criminal. Thank God this is the last of this wretched Nazarene. Talking about he's the son of God. Yes, we were correct to order his death. But wait, this is the second word. And Jesus' first word was, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. And now he welcomes a criminal into paradise. Brothers and sisters, Jesus was just walking his talk. Father, forgive them. And now he demonstrates what forgiveness looks like. Wiping the slate clean. Jesus is still at work on the cross. Even his own excruciating anguish. Taking the opportunity to usher in a criminal into his kingdom. Did we not hear him early in his ministry say to his disciples, I must work the work of him who sent me while it is day? And brothers and sisters, it was still daylight. And our Jesus was at work. What a savior. 
Let's take a closer look at this scene at Golgotha. Jesus and two criminals are there because they are sentenced to crucifixion. Soldiers nail each of them to the cross, placing Jesus between them. Not sure why Jesus put in the middle. Maybe he was placed there as he was the most notable of the prisoners. This is the known teacher going around, healing the sick, providing food for thousands, raising the dead. And many had hoped that he would be the one to rescue Israel from the Roman oppression. And they remember that joyous, that joyous entrance into Jerusalem with all those palm branches and the waving, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But he was despised by the religious leaders. And they got Pilate to condemn him. Pilate had directed the soldiers to place a sign over, his, over him and saying, the king of the Jews, much to the anger of the Jewish religious leaders, but Pilate would have none of it. That sign was going to stay there. Jesus, the one who did no wrong, is condemned to death. Most likely, the three were in the company of each other from the night before, seeing each other being whipped and scourged. The criminals with Jesus must have wondered why they weren't as lucky as Barabbas, a fellow insurgent, locked up with them, getting ready for crucifixion, but he's a free man today, saying someone took his place. Wow, what a gift. So here they were, nailed to a cross, dying for all Jerusalem to see. All eyes were on Jesus. The rulers of the synagogue, the religious elite, mocked him insulted him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he's the chosen one. And the soldiers, they got in the act too. If you are the king of the Jews, come down, save yourself. And Luke tells us that one of the criminals piled on insults. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself or not. But the other criminal rebuked him, saying, don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And in the midst of all those insults being hurled at Jesus, he never said a word. And as I read this, I can think of the African-American spiritual. He never said a mumbling word, not a word, not a word. But something powerful is happening in the heart of this criminal, the one who rebuked the other guy. He had an epiphany. The lights went on and he could see clearly. That's why he couldn't join in the insult. Questions began to bubble in his mind. Who is this that asks God to forgive them? Who is this who faced a night of beating and never for a moment cursed his captors as we did? Hmm, but this is Jesus, the teacher who was healing all over Capernaum, the one who welcomed anyone who came into him. Yeah, look at Zacchaeus, that wretched one. Everyone had heard how Jesus went to his house for dinner, and the stories of Jesus' activities were just coming back to him as he looked at Jesus' blood-stained face. What happened in his heart? We do not know, but something miraculous happened. He turns to Jesus <clears throat> at a point when Jesus was far from looking like a king and says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In other words, Remember me when you take your seat of power. I want to be under your rulership. What an acknowledgement of the kingship of Jesus. Should the religious leaders steeped in the prophecies have recognized him? Shouldn't all the disciples who were with him for the three years have recognized him? No, they did not. It is a condemned criminal who recognizes Jesus, the king of kings. And somehow I'm reminded of Jesus' words early in his ministry. Those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, 
I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That was Jesus' statement when his disciples were questioned why their Lord was always hanging out with the undesirable. This criminal recognized he was one of the sick ones, a sinner, and cried out to Jesus, the only one who could address his need. And right at the cross, during his pain, or Jesus responds to a sinner's act of faith with those comforting words, today you'll be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. So what about the other criminals? Why didn't he have a similar experience? Two men on either side of Jesus making requests and only one is answered. Why? The request of this criminal was for Jesus to get off the cross and save him too. In other words, take care of my knees, the knees that I have right now. I need to get off. The truth is, Jesus could have saved himself and those criminals. But that would be going against his father's agenda. Yes, as the songwriter says, he could have called 10,000 angels to set him free. But he died alone for you and me. Aren't we glad today that Jesus did not answer that request? We would not have been given the opportunity to experience a relationship with our God. There will be no Good Friday to celebrate the God, what God accomplished through Jesus for each of us. In answering the other criminal's request to be remembered, paradise, an unbroken relationship with God, was open to him and to you and to you and to you and to you and me. What love, what love. Jesus paid the debt he did not owe. So you and I can freely enjoy a relationship with God our Father. Where are we today? Good Friday, 2024, right here. Where are we? If we are honest, we must confess that sometimes, maybe too many times, we, like the first criminal, get stuck in our own agenda, wanting God to respond on our terms. Fix this for me, God. And God just goes silent, leaving us to our own devices. The truth is, Jesus is only seeking persons who will own him as Savior and intentionally make him Lord of their life. Today, today is the day of salvation. Let each of us deliberately turn from the popular pathway of doing things our way and allow the King of Kings to rule our lives. That's paradise, experiencing a lifelong relationship with the King of Kings beginning today. Will you cry out to him today? He's longing to hear from each of us. Amen. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, we beseech thee mercifully. Hear our prayer and spare all those who confess their sins unto thee, that they whose conscience by sin are accused by thy merciful pardon, may be absolved through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Sister Davis, for those words. And the third word, a reading taken from John chapter 19, verses 26 and 27. When Jesus saw his mother, dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home.
the hymn number 292, What Wondrous Love Is This? The congregation may remain seated. And good evening to each and every one. Jesus' third word from the cross, Woman, behold thy son. Lord, speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of thy word. As thou hast sought, so let me seek thine erring children lost and lone. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O God, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. This third word of Jesus from the cross shows our Savior's human side. He loved his mother. He cared for her as a loving son should, even at the point of his greatest difficulty and distress. He had the love and compassion of a son, and he bore the duty faithfully. Woman, behold your son. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved, 
standing nearby. He said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. John 19, 25 to 29. Jesus called his mother woman. At first glance, this seems impersonal. Yet, consider the tender heart of God in Christ Jesus in these words. And he had loved his mother as no other son had ever loved a mother before or since. Jesus' third word from the cross to this small crowd of faithful friends huddled below is fascinating for all that it implies. On the cross, we see his love for her was great. Jesus' greatest love towards his mother was not that of a son to a mother, but that of God to one of his beloved children. Christ is caring for his people here on earth today. Even as he died, Jesus showed his deep and genuine concern for others. Jesus did not come to serve, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Of the four gospel writers, John is the only one who records Mary's presence at the cross. But it would be expected that Jesus' mother be in Jerusalem for the Passover. We read in Luke 2.41, every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. Mary would come up to Jerusalem for the feast with friends and relatives. Mary, surely Mary's place was close to her son. She is near him now, but her heart is broken. She's consoled by friends and relatives. Can a woman tender care cease towards that child she bear? Can a mother forget the babe at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Isaiah 49, 15 and 16. Standing there, watching her son, hanging on the cross, so many images must be passing through Mary's mind, holding the newborn baby in her arms as she and Joseph shares the bonds with animals, searching frantically for this child Jesus when he stopped to argue scriptures with the leaders of the synagogue. The first miracle that he performed at her request when they were guests at a wedding and the wine ran out. Those were images that would stick with her long after this horrible day was over. Those images would remind her of her love for her son and the joy that he brought her. Those images would also make her heart ache each time anew and the loss of that source of love, joy, and pride. How unjust this must have seemed. No parent is supposed to bury their child. The child is meant to grow old and take care of their parents. And so, as Jesus' mother stands near the cross watching, we can be assured that it is not an easy moment for her. Maybe she's trying to hold herself together to be a support for, some, uh, for her son who is dying. Maybe she's standing there sobbing in the face of this incredible injustice. From this moment, her life will be forever changed by the loss of her son. The disciple whom Jesus loved, John, one of the three disciples closest to him is the only male disciple who is at the foot of the cross as Jesus is dying. The others are too afraid to be closely identified with a man condemned to die by the Romans 
as well as by their own leaders. Mark 14, 50, and Luke 23 and 49. But John, John is nearby, perhaps to accompany his own mother. Now, the level of love and commitment that Jesus calls them to have for one another is the deepest that there can be. To understand just how serious this commitment is, we need to look back to the Ten Commandments. There is only one commandment that comes with a blessing. That is, honor your father and mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be prolonged and that it will go well with you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Deuteronomy 5 and 16. That it is set apart as the only commandment that comes with a blessing tells us that it is important. Jesus was not calling them into some kind of superficial relationship of being nice to one another. They were to be there for each other and take care of each other for the rest of their lives. What I think is so powerful about this word is that Jesus isn't just concerned about his own mother. It is not just making sure that she's cared for, which is his responsibility under the law. He is also concerned about his friend, John. Jesus can look into the eyes of John and see his fear, his grief, his pain. And Jesus wanted to do something to help take care of John at that moment and for the rest of his life. So in compassion and love for John, Jesus said to his mother, Mary, behold your son. Jesus wants Mary to take her love and share it with John, who would need so much love and support in the days to come. Jesus wanted these two people to take care of each other as a family. And I think that is still God's word for us today. This is not just a compassionate word that Jesus has for Mary and John from the cross. This is a word of direction for the church. We are to become a family in very real and practical ways. We are to care for one another. We are to care for one another the way we would care for our children and our parents. We need to seek ways to deepen and develop relationships with those around us who might need a little extra love and attention. We need to be willing to sacrifice what we have for the needs of others. In a final word from the cross, Jesus created a family. And, in, and his word for us today is to still be a family. What does this word from the cross teach us? As we reflect on this third word from the cross, I begin to see something about the extent of Jesus' love. He's dying in agony, grasping for each breath. He sees his mother, the one who comforted him throughout all of his childhood. But now, as he sees her at the foot of the cross, heartbroken, weeping, inconsolable, his heart goes out to her rather than being consumed by an understandable concern of his own welfare. He's touched by hers. He did this far better and far more than we could expect. And he does the same for us today. He's not on the cross. He has no distraction that he might not take care of us. His love is focused on us and his grace, forgiveness, purchase, and one on the cross 
is already accomplished. Now, he takes care of us. He has met our biggest need, forgiveness and life everlasting. And now he tends to all of our needs. In your needs and in your times of trouble, this word of Jesus stands to remind us that he takes care of us in every circumstance. If nails and humiliation and pain and distraction could not keep Jesus from seeing and remembering and caring for Mary and John, there is nothing now that could keep his love from us or his attention from seeing and meeting our needs. Today, we stand near the cross of Jesus. What pain and fear are you experiencing? What loss threatens to overwhelm you? Maybe the loss, the loss of a loved one through death or separation. Maybe the loss of a job and security that it brings. Maybe the loss of future opportunities. Whatever it is, Jesus is looking down on us today. And he's saying, I see your cares. I see your wants. I know your suffering. I have felt it. The Roman soldiers had taken a thorn of crown and they crushed it upon my head. He had suffered incredible loss of blood. He was desperately weak and thirsty. They took spikes, driving them into his wrists and feet, fastening him to the cross. The physical cost he was paying for our sins was enormous because he died so that we may be forgiven. He died to make us good. He died so that we can go at last to heaven, saved by his precious blood. Standing near the cross, we can be assured that God, through Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, does love us, does know the pain that we are suffering, and does provide for us. The risen Christ is so full of glorious riches that he needs not turn any one of us away. As Paul says in Romans 10 and 12, there is no distinction between Jews and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches to all who call upon him. Therefore, the word of Jesus to his mother from the cross is a great encouragement to our faith. For if he could provide for his own in the moment of his weakness and humiliation, how much more? Can he meet our needs today from the right hand of God the Father, full of power and wealth and glory? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Jack, for that message. We must, be, we must treat each other as family, even those who are sick and shut in. Remember that they are part of the St. Paul's family. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Infinite and eternal spirit, our God and our Father, author of all good and never far from any of thy children, have we drawn near to thee that in fellowship with thee we may receive of thy spirit? May all the bonds of love and ties of friendship be made stronger and sweeter through him, who in his mortal agony was not unforgetful that we need one another's love, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The fourth word 
is taken from Mark chapter 15, verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The hymn number 299. Again, the congregation may remain seated and join in the singing. At the sixth hour, darkness covered the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabathani which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The word forsaken is one of the most painful words in the English language. It symbolizes abandonment, separation, and rejection. We are aware of the events that led to this cry. It was now the ninth hour. For three hours, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, a supernatural darkness covered over the old land. This was an extraordinary moment. For during these three hours, everything was quiet. A stillness was on the earth. 
This was not the first time a benefactor was put to death. But this man hanging on the cross was no ordinary man. He was the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, our Savior and Redeemer, the one who knew no sin. He was a perfect man. For Pilate said, I found no fault in him. On this day, things were different. For three hours, Jesus was experiencing something he had never felt before. This was the high point of his suffering. For his suffering and pains were both emotional and physical. He had asked his father to take this cup from him if it was possible. Now he felt rejected and a sense of separation from God his loving father. Jesus had a loving relationship with his father. During his 33 years on earth, he enjoyed a close, unbroken communion with his father. He said, I and my father are one. And it was God who said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Yet, now he was separated from his father and delivered to die a shameful death. This was the climax of his suffering. The soldiers mocked him cruelly. They placed a crown of thorn on his head. They, they went as far as to spit on him. They stripped him of his garments and left him to shame. The crowds were taunting him. They pierced his hands and feet. And by this time, the separation from his father had saturated his spirit. Feeling alone, he cried out, not addressing God as his father, but as his God. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? These were words of anguish. These were words of deepest misery. These were words of despair. Jesus was confident as to who he was. When asked by Pilate, are you the king of the Jews? He said, yes, it is as you say. And when the high priest asked, are you the Christ? Jesus said, I am. You know that he was the son of God. He felt assured that his father would never leave him or forsake him. For he remembered when the children of Israel cried out to God that when they were in bondage, and he heard them, how he took them across the Red Sea when they were helpless. He remembered the three Jewish boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were cast into the fiery furnace. How God was with them. Now, no one was by his side to comfort him. He was abandoned, separated from God. For David said, I will never see the righteous forsaken. For God will not forsake his people. Here, we see the righteous one forsaken. Here on the cross, something was causing that separation. It was during these three hours that Jesus bore our sins. It was here that we see the awfulness of sin. It is here that the characteristic of sin was displayed. It was midday and the darkness covered the earth. Sin loves darkness rather than light. The hostility against God by Satan was evident. Hatred towards God. The Son of God was rejected, despised and crucified by man. The wages of sin is death, not just physical death. The wages of sin is spiritual death. Sin separates us from God. Sin alienates us from God. Here on the cross, Jesus is bearing our sin in his body. He had no sin of his own. For he was a whole son of God. 
He has taken our place, our place, your place, my place, and was suffering on the cross, the just for the unjust. He was bearing the wages of our sin and suffering the chastisement with which, which were due to us, death and separation from his Father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You see, God is a holy God. He is so holy that even the angels veiled their face before him. When Abraham stood before him, he cried, I am but dust and ashes. You see, friends, sin separates us from the holy God. And Jesus, the Savior, was bearing our sin. And the holy God, who could not look at him, here you see sin personified and God's justice enacted. The experience on the cross revealed how God sees sin and how sin can and will separate us from God. At the cross, we see how sin has caused God to turn his back. It is at the cross where we see God's justice satisfied and his holiness vindicated. At the cross, Jesus, in our sinful state, expressed his need for God when he cried out to him. This was not a cry of distress. This was a cry of distress because he knew that God had withdrawn himself from him so that his purpose might be accomplished. This is the basic of our salvation, the need for God. How often we sing, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Here, Jesus needed his father, but he was being wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. He was bearing our sins. God's claim against us has been fulfilled, has been fully satisfied. Jesus Christ, our Savior, was forsaken by his father for a purpose, so that you and I, might have abundant life. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus was forsaken so that you and I may be forgiven from our sins. Jesus was forsaken so that you and I might enjoy the cup of joy. For there is joy, real joy, wonderful joy in the Lord when we let Jesus Christ into our hearts. Jesus Christ was forsaken so that you and I may walk in the light. John 15 verse 13 reminds us, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Oh, what love! For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. God spared not his own son when he took our sinful place on Calvary. And he is not going to spare us if we reject him as our Lord and Savior. Today, are you separated from God? Do you feel abandoned and alone? Nothing is more hurtful than being rejected. Come to Jesus. He bore it all. Alone, alone. He bore it all alone. He gave himself to save its own, you and I. He suffered, bled, and died alone. He paid the price. The songwriter said, There is love. There's life for a look at the crucified one. There's life at this moment for thee. Then look, sinners, look unto him and be safe unto him who was nailed to the tree. And take with rejoicing from Jesus as once the life everlasting he gives. And now with assurance thou need never die since Jesus thy righteousness live. Look, look and live. There is life for a look at the crucified one. There's life at this moment for thee.
Today, God is crying in a loud voice. He's saying to us, my children, my children, why are you forsaking me? He's saying to us to come to him before it's too late. Amen. Let us pray. We gather at the foot of your cross, gentle Savior, brought together from the empty places of our sacred lives. Too often we wander away from you, only to cry out in anguish as we find ourselves in wilderness places. We often hide from you, only to discover that we are lost without you. Open our eyes to see you, our ears to hear you, and our hearts to love you as you gather us to yourself. Help us to be mindful of your holy presence always in our lives. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Shan, for that message. At this time, we pause to give back to God a portion of what he has blessed us with. Would the ushers come forward as we sing the hymn, Glory to His Name.
giver of the most precious gift of all. We return to you this day our thanks represented in these gifts and in the lives of all these dear people. Bless these gifts and all these people that they may be lights of your love in our dark world. Amen. The fifth word is taken from John chapter 19, reading verses 28 and 29. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. The hymn number 359 alas and did my savior die
The devil is a sly old fox. If I could catch him, I'd put him in a box, lock that door, and throw away the key for all those tricks he has played on me. I came to church this morning. I came with an empty glasses case. I prepared my word for about a week ago. I read it over and over so I could know it. And I was going to owe you all with my sermon today. And then I found out I prepared the wrong word. <laughs> so a few minutes ago, I went to the office and and I talked to God. I said, if you could just show me 50 short words, the congregation would be glad because it will be short. <laughs> Lord, thy word abide there and our footsteps guided who oh, its truth believe in light and joy receive it. so my word is the fifth word that's why I was asking for 50 words Jesus words I thirst may have pointed not only to his willingness to drink the cup of suffering, sin, and hate, but to drink it down to the dregs. I thirst. His thirst is a desire to point out love and mercy. Jesus said, I thirst from the cross. He said that because he wanted his lips to be moist. So when he speaks, you know when you're thirsty and your mouth is dry, you're unable to speak audible. So he said, I'm thirst because he wanted us to hear. He wanted you to hear what he was saying. And he was human. He's showing that he was human. It was coming to the end of his human life. Jesus complete the work he began to satisfy our longings for the life beyond death. To quench souls that thirst for the living word. I thirst. When you thirst, or when you drink the living water, it's a symbol of salvation and the Holy Spirit. When you drink the living water, or when we drink the living water, we will never thirst again and we will have eternal life. Oh, that we discerning It's the most holy learning Lord, may love and fear thee Evermore be near Thank you, Sister Lynette, for that brief message. Okay. The hymn is number... Oh. Almighty God, 
whose dear son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than that, the way of life and peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The sixth word, a reading taken from John chapter 19, verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The hymn number 297 beneath the cross. Let's give God the praise this morning, this afternoon. Come on, guys, let's give him a praise. It is finished. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Upon the cross of Jesus, the lyric says, my eyes at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me. And from my stricken heart with tears, two things I confess, the wonders of redeeming love and my unworthiness. Our unworthiness. Father God, it is because of your love that hung upon the cross that you gave everything for me for us to restore us, to rescue us. 
It is finished as a cry of victory because you defeated everything that hold us in captivity. Thank you for this amazing gift, Lord. Amen. I must say that um, when Pastor had asked, you know, you know, who want to do what word, the Spirit said, it is finished. Because, you know, there were a few words that I had ministered in the past, the first five, and I thought it was the next step forward. But I must tell you, it's a very challenging word. Very challenging word. And as I shared with my sister earlier, who also shared the mishap, you know, it was not without work, not without prayer, and not without belief that God would deliver the word he intended for us to hear today. Amen? There are many parts of the world where a Good Friday is an ordinary weekday, a work day for many. Churches are not packed like a Christmas or a New Year's service. I understand that not every church has a service like this one today because they are closed or where the only service the people experience or have to look forward to is the resurrection service on Sunday when we talk about Christ is risen. So it is, it is actually a very important service for us. And as many still sit in their homes right now watching a Good Friday service or on television all around the world, the crucifixion movies, the expressions of anger, Hatred and sorrow are always surface to the treatment of Jesus. I, too, admit, when I watched the Passion of the Christ and witnessed the brutal treatment of Jesus, I am filled with anger. My own accountability and remorse that ultimately leads to a repentant heart. But perhaps we need to continue to change the narrative that the crucifixion story was not an act, was an act of great love by the Father. In order that the Son would do his will. An act that was foretold in history that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we gather this Good Friday service as believers to hear the words of Christ. The messages we have heard today are evidence of God's plan to redeem, restore, and to save us from ourselves. There is a saying that when a man's life has reached its end, it flashes before their eyes. Imagine Jesus on the cross, the man of God, when he walked the earth, experienced life, in its fullness. The man, the beloved son, filled with the Holy Spirit, who gave instructions from the Father and drew strength for his journey and ministry, who was tempted by the devil, who became teacher, rabbi, and friend, who laughed, cried, and wept, who prayed for his disciples, for you and for me, who experienced the joy of love and brotherhood, who performed miracles of healing and embraced the breathtaking pain of betrayal, the Lamb of God who was preparing to be slain for all mankind, each and every one of us and who was willing to endure humiliation. This man, who was shamed, stripped, spat on, insulted, ridiculed, chastised, wrongly accused, he was willing to go to his own death in obedience 
to the Father, and especially for us. With every beat of his heart, he uttered these last few words of instruction to all at the foot of the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. A message of forgiveness. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise, a promise of salvation. Woman, here is your son. Son, here is your mother. A declaration of his love for us whom he loves. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A desire to end the suffering of the world. I thirst, an expressive need to return to the Father. And so the sixth word, it is finished. Hallelujah. It is finished. Glory be to God. Through research and understanding the text, there are a few things Jesus finished on the cross. The long night of his suffering. The soldiers and guards marched Jesus into Jerusalem in the darkness. Over the next few hours, he endured six trials, three religious and three civil and all were illegal. During those trials, he was mocked, slapped, and punched over and over again. But Jesus never fought back. Numbers 14 verse 18 says, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. While on the cross, Jesus suffered physically, spiritually, and emotional, emotionally. More than any common man here might endure. In Mark's gospel, in the torment of his crucifixion, in about the third hour, between the ninth, 9 a.m. and noon, Jesus hung on the cross until his death in about 3 a.m., the ninth hour. In this moment, imagine you are near the end, suspended in the air by nails pierced in your hands and feet, with a bruised and blooded head, with the sun high in the day, would you be thinking of the reason you hung there? I imagine that whatever the task to be accomplished, somehow it seems heavier, like a burden, almost unbearable to carry. In life, we are faced with such situations where impatience of wanting whatever it is that we have to do. We just want it to get over, right? We want it to be done, set already. That moment where you feel like giving up or giving in, that moment when you think you may not make it to the end, that moment dripping in sweat and blood, his arms tired, cramping even till all the feeling is almost gone when the task was about to be finished. And then we pause to check our to-do list of items in hopes of completing the task. We ask ourselves, did I accomplish everything in the list? Did I do, did I miss anything? Jesus hung there on the cross in suffering so that he could be closer to us than a brother or a sister. Jesus hung there so that he can be the peace we need from within. 
Jesus hung there because he could be the hope for our future. Jesus hung there so that he could give us the inner joy in the midst of our mourning and despair. Jesus came to live a life as a ransom for many. And on the cross, he said, it is finished. He has borne the guilt of our sins. He has endured the punishment of our hell. The divine wrath has been spent on him. The justice of God have been satisfied in him. God accepted his payment for our price. Jesus was being crucified to be laid behind a stone to die for us, rejected and alone, like a rose trampled on the ground. He took the fall and he thought of me and he thought of you above all. Our triumphant Lord was the key. He was chosen and anointed, the firstborn son of the living God. Jesus was the only one who could have perfectly kept every commandment given by God because he was born without sin. By his obedience, Jesus fulfills all righteousness. His one act of obedience, referring to the entire course of his existence since the beginning and throughout his life, he secured life for all his people. Jesus was the chosen one. In Isaiah's prophecy of Jesus giving sight to the blind, Christ has opened our eyes to see the truth about God and his love for us. By this, he set the oppressed free. In the book of Psalm, David gave a detailed description of Jesus being pierced and crucified a thousand years before it happened. In the book of Daniel, we read of Daniel foretelling history and testifying to exactly what Peter was telling Cornelius, that everyone who believes will receive forgiveness through his name. And let's not forget the warning of Israel, history, throughout time in the book of the Bible. But especially in 1 Corinthians, it speaks of a people saved time and time again, having been given spiritual milk, spiritual food, and still finding themselves bathed and clothed in sin. Yet God was not pleased with them. The Israelites were saved, blessed, and rescued, yet they continued to be idolaters, indulge in revelry, sexual immorality, grumble and complaints that led to the, to the destruction and death of thousands. Isaiah 61, one to three reminds us that the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the accepted year of the Lord. In the three years of his ministry, traveling over the course of over 40 miles from Judea to Jerusalem and visiting towns and cities, this time is symbolic, right now, of a year of Jubilee up until the time of the death of his resurrection, death and his resurrection. Since the day of vengeance was not this day or time, but it is in the future, the day of judgment. The people thought, but Jesus didn't come to slay the Roman armies or governmental rule. He did not come to release us from financial debts even. Jesus came to provide a release 
from spiritual debt. Matthew 20, verse 28 says, Even as the Son of Man came, not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Christ did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. The threat had already been taken care of. Saints, since the beginning of time in the book of Genesis, the threat had already been taken care of. Scripture in Romans 5, 12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all mankind because of sin. And so, saints, I want us to really remember, also in the book of Genesis, that the word that God said that when Adam and Eve, let me pause, when the tempter tempted Adam and Eve in the garden, he sought to put a barrier between God and us. He may even have been jealous of the power and love that God had for them. They must have been living too well, being that they were provided for and they were obedient because they only knew God as their all in all. And Satan tempted them to rip them away from the loving embrace of the Father. In his scheme to convince them to eat of the tree of knowledge and evil, we see a separation occurring between God and man. This sin created a separation of God from us. The gospel text tells us that the curtain in the temple tore in two. This is symbolic of sin committed that separated us from God as if we were ripped or stripped of our relationship with God. The veil from manner and customs in Genesis 4.65 tells us of a woman covering her face in respect to her master. This same veil can be thought of in terms of what took place on this grave day. You might say a veil for a veil, a veil of truth for a veil of lies, a veil of truth stripped away from us for a veil of lies that the enemy led us to. And so this veil, again, had to be stripped in order to renew that right relationship. In Matthew 24, the text talks about the destruction of the temple. In the beginning, it was not necessary to build a temple, a sanctuary, because God was with Adam and Eve, and he was very close to them. The building of the temple throughout biblical history was to create a right place to worship God. Man, in Jesus' time, created a temple of dishonor and remained spiritually distant or dead to God because they would taint it with their sins and disobedience. So the temple must be destroyed to rebuild the temple of God, a reconciliation and relationship back to God. So all that was left for us to come into what God had already done. So many times we worry about things but God had already changed them. The healing we are seeking, the breakthrough we have been waiting for, the miracle we need that has already been set in motion. And all that is required of us is to simply trust God, 
All that we need to do is have faith that God is in control of all the situations in our lives. After the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, Christ set a wrong, set a right the wrongs, reclaiming the sanctuary for a holy place of worship for God, not for sale. Our worship is not for sale. Our worship to God must be true because the word of God says, you must worship me in spirit and in truth. Jesus Christ put to death our sin on the cross, breaking its power over us. Because he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. You see, saints, it was already done, as stated in the book of Genesis. The decision had already been made by God since the beginning. And on the seventh day, God rested. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. See, God had already set in motion that the, the Christ would be the sacrificial lamb. Because God is all powerful and all knowing. In creation, he created men in his image with the power only to see the path that mankind had before them. And so, he set things in motion because we could not comprehend the complexities of creation and his prevenient grace. When Jesus said, it is finished, it is a declaration that he set out to do what was accomplished. We wrestle for power, control, and a place of authority like James and John. We forget to clothe ourselves in humility. We allow our sins to block us from building our relationship with the Father. When we have the power to do good, because we are made in God's image. Jesus, saints, is the only way to eternal life. Salvation is possible only because of God's grace, mercy, and love for us. Saints, if I suffer for the good God calls me to, all I ask for is his strength and courage to persevere. It is my belief that momentary, momentary suffering is worth an eternity with him. Christ did it just for us, and he was finished and ready to return to the Father. It is finished. Christ didn't have to become God with us but he willingly chose to do it. It is finished. Christ pointed, creation pointed to Christ and Christ rescued us and showed us the power and the love of God. The aftermath of our reconciliation is that people's testimonies can help others to believe the truth of the gospel. Romans 10, 17 says, so then, faith come by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This verse of Paul's letters points to the most crucial moment in our Christian history. Our daily struggles requires God's strength. Like a single mother juggling jobs and taking care of a child or children. Like someone battling a chronic illness or experiencing spiritual bondage, addiction, financial problems, 
or relationship issues. On the cross, Jesus Christ's strength was made perfect in our weakness. We need God's strength, resilience, and a profound reliance on a power greater than our own. In the countless times where we are most fearful and feel overwhelmed and alone, God's promise kicks into action as we people of faith can learn to count on the scriptures. As it says in Isaiah 41, fear not, for I am with you. Be ye not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will be your helper. In our own weakness, our own expressions of anger at each other can lead us into unrighteous living. But if you have gained any knowledge, it is to be certain to remind us that Christ did not die in vain. He died to redeem us all. We must put the sin and shame aside because Christ has already offered us redemption. And we no longer need to hear, bear the suffering that he died because he saved us. The impact or effect we can have on each other by living a righteous life is possibly if we truly understand God's love and second commandment, to love one another. When we see the evils that exist in the world today, wars and rumors of war, the unimaginable deaths and massacres of people, women and children, leaders fighting over land or power, and power that we are afforded used to dishonor and abuse one another. This kind of evil is not a new concept, saints. It just takes different forms. Repentance is an act of turning away from our sins and acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus Christ is our Savior who is dying on the cross for us. Forgiveness is not just a possibility. It is a reality for those who believe. Saints, Jesus paid the price for our past, our present, and our future. What is Good Friday? What is good about this special Friday? Salvation belongs to each of us by the death and dying of Jesus. He bled and died to take away our sins. His blood is cleansing and healing. We can stand as Christians knowing that through the name of Jesus, forgiveness is granted and reconciliation is made possible with God and others by way of the Holy Spirit. Jesus conquered death. He is our mediator to the Father. And he lives and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He reigns in glory and I receive the victory. Saints, we can overcome because Christ has overcome. The God of miracles fought for you on that Good Friday. The God of miracles fights for you today because he is mighty and he is worthy. And I leave you with a final thought. Our faith is tested daily, brothers and sisters in Christ. But like the thief on the cross who recognized the power and authority of Jesus and put his faith in the only one who can kill the body and the soul, we must believe, like the songwriter sings, of a blessed assurance that Jesus is ours. He's our savior. He's our healer. Our high priest that made atonement for our sins 
on that Good Friday. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Glory divine that came to us. We had an heir of salvation. The purchase of God with his one and only firstborn son, born of the spirit and washed in his blood. My grace, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. This grace, saints, is greater than our sins. This is the justifying grace that is offered to Christ, that is offered to us, for all, all of us, I would say, are deemed unworthy of his love. Thanks be to God. Amen. It is finished. Hallelujah. Christ paid the price. It is finished. The work has been completed. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God for his saving grace and his love. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Minister Boyce. Let us pray. Thou forgiver of sin, healer of sorrow, vanquisher of death, draw us unto thyself, who art our salvation and all our conquering hope. Make us citizens of thy kingdom, people of invincible goodwill, builders of a world where righteousness shall keep us steadfast, reign and the law of love shall triumph over hate and strife. Hasten the day when thou shalt take upon thyself thy great power and reign, increase in us true devotion unto thyself, nourish us with goodness and of thy great mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. The seventh word taken from Luke chapter 23, reading verses 44 to 46. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The hymn number 622, There is a fountain filled with blood. The congregation, stand please.
poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave. You have here, I heard all the speakers, six of them. And what they already told you was all the things that Christ came to accomplish. He came in the flesh to walk this hurt and to teach us how to live right, how to walk right. And he came to live so he could bore our pain. He could feel our suffering. He know what rejection is. He know when he had enough. And when all of that was accomplished, he said these final words to his father. He said, now into your hands, I commend my spirit. That's a question that's always asked. How many of us think that at the time of our death, we will be conscious enough to say to God, in your hands, I commend my spirit. When you minister to folks, even folks who are unsaved, they will tell you that, oh, I will wait until my dying day because the thief on the cross got saved then. Remember, there were two of them. One didn't get over his ego, so he didn't make it in. We never know what's going to happen, how we're going to die. You're here one minute, and the next minute you're gone. You're here worshiping because we see on the news of folks worship. They were in worship either in Bible study or in church. And the next thing you know, there were bullets flying in the sanctuary. Unknowing to folks that there was a gunman who was coming in or there was a gunman sitting in the sanctuary. There are folks standing at the bus stop waiting for the bus. And here come a drunken driver right on the sidewalk. They didn't even have time to say Jesus. The thief broke in your house at night while you're sleeping. For you to be able to do what Jesus did, you have to be really con connected to God. You have to be really connected to God to know that when danger comes, you can call upon him. Don't wait till that moment. Like the thief on the cross. Scripture said salvation has come to your house today. This time, right now, not tomorrow, today. Because that's what he said to the thief on the cross. He said, this day, right now, you shall be with me in paradise. His body didn't go to paradise, his spirit went. Your body not going to paradise, it's the spirit, it's the spirit man, because it's the spirit that communicates with God. Our body doesn't communicate with God. But Jesus had that connection with his father. He was grounded with his father, that he understand that what God has sent him here to do, what his father had sent him to do, is now accomplished. It's accomplished. I know we could stand and say, even on the cross while he was dying, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, not his body, his spirit, because his body ain't going nowhere. Your spirit. Can you see your spirit? Can you see the spirit, man? Remember in Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned, and God came and he said, Adam, where are you? And he said, we are hiding because we are, I found out I was naked. That's what he said, I'm naked, so we are hiding. And God said to them, how do you know you was naked? You disobeyed me. You eat of the fruit that I told you not to. And when we read the scripture, remember, God clothed them. That's when God put flesh on humanity. Because we were born, God created us as spirit being. So that's why I was able to, the scripture said, in the cool of the day, we'd come into the garden where they were, and they would have fellowship. But when man sinned, God clothed us in flesh. So now this flesh separates us from God. So for us to be back in true, perfect union with God, 
we got to get rid of this flesh. And the only way we're going to get rid of it is when we die. Like Christ showed to us 2,000 years today at Calvary, when he died, get rid of this flesh, and the spirit man took our new identity and went back to heaven. So that's why we are here today celebrating. We're celebrating what Christ came to do for us. And he said it was accomplished, it was done. So it's for us. As we prepare ourselves, as we prepare our lives for that day when we pass from this earth. Because what we do when we leave here, we just change our address. The scripture said it's appointed unto man once to die and after death comes the judgment. Jesus said to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house, there are many mansions. And if it was not so, I would have told you. But now I go to prepare a place for you. And when I prepare that place, I'm coming back to receive you unto myself. So while he's preparing a place, we are preparing our lives for that next life. Because we're all going to live again after this life. The decision we make here determines where we spend that eternity. The decision we make here help us to say, like Jesus could say to the Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. The songwriter put it this way for us. He said, when peace like a river attended my way, when sorrow like sea billows roar, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Can you honestly say today, without a shadow of a doubt, that it is well, it is well with your soul. Amen. Most holy Lord and God, we praise and glorify you for the love that we have received your son Jesus Christ. We thank you, O oh God, that we can turn to you in all things, that we can commit our whole selves to you. We are yours, O oh God, all that we have and are. Now we give ourselves to you. Accept our sacrifice of praise, your great love. Receive us to yourself and let us to your glory. Amen. Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And just before our closing hymn, Pastor, in the announcement, it has 10.30 a.m. service on Sunday. Is it at 10.30? Okay. So for those of you who are going to the beach on Sunday morning, there is a bus that is leaving here. The bus is leaving at 5 a.m. I repeat that, the bus is leaving at 5 a.m. So you need to get here before 5 a.m. And after the service at the beach, you will return here for our regular service at 10 a.m. Breakfast. Breakfast. <laughs> and the menu is excellent. <laughs> okay. So. Escovitch fish, fried dumplings, ackee and salt fish, boiled banana and dumplings, kalalo and salt fish. Fry, fry plantains and sister Lynn have bakes. Coffee, cocoa, and other, and tea. <laughs> that, that, that's for all those who come to the beach. Those who drop in, we have a price tag for you. Thank you, thank you, Pastor. And thank you for coming out today. And I hope the messages you have heard here today will remain in you and that you live those messages in your daily life. 
Our closing hymn is number 363, And Can It Be That I Should Gain?
So today, as we continue the celebration, there's no benediction. He's in the grave. Sunday, come back. Lot is in store for you on Sunday. So keep loving on each other because that's what today is all about. Christ's love towards us. Amen.